Hello, welcome to Learning Beyond Tomorrow, the Education Leadership Forum presented by Oxford University Press, China. And today is our deep pleasure to have Mr. Bogdan Kopil, is the EdTech Specialist of EdPuzzle, to join us today and give us a, a talk on the topic of Universal Design for Learning, UDL, for an inclusive classroom. Now, Mr. Kopil is the specialist from Apple, which is a platform with lots and lots of video lessons and resources for teachers around the world. And um, we are especially thankful for uh, Mr. Kopil because we know that he's joining us live from Prague in Czech Republic. It's about 4 a.m. there in the morning. So we're grateful for you. And uh, without further ado, I'll now hand over to Mr. Kopil. Over to you now, thank you. With you, even though it is 4 a.m. for me, indeed, uh, it's always very exciting to be working with uh, educators uh, and uh, uh, and just uh, connecting with educators from all over the world. So, um, as you've mentioned, I do work with a puzzle, uh, but besides that, I am also a Google for Education certified trainer and an ISTA certified trainer. So my biggest passion is looking at how teachers and educators worldwide can actually use technology better in the classroom. So this is why I am here uh, talking to you basically about UDL, about inclusive classrooms, about technology, and a bit about Edpuzzle as well, of course, as a case study, just seeing how it can actually benefit teachers from all over the world. So, um, as as you as uh, mentioned already, the topic for today is UDL. UDL standing for Universal Design for Learning, uh, and uh, that will be the main focus of the session. So, thank you once again for having me as a speaker. Um, if uh, anybody wants to get in touch with me after the session, if you have questions or something like that, you can always connect on Twitter at, at Mr. Copil, or you also have my email on the slide. But um, uh, also throughout the session, we will have a Q&A uh, session at the end of the uh, presentation. But if you have any other questions, please feel free to bring them forward. So let's dive right in and start with the very beginning. What is the background and what's the premise for talking about UDL and universal design for learning? Um, one of the big things that constantly changes inside classrooms all over the world is that classrooms are more and more diverse. And when we talk about diversity, we can think about lots of different things that happen in the classroom from international audiences um, to uh, different levels uh, in terms of uh, learning ability to even in some cases, some disabilities or some special educational needs. And this is one of the, uh, I would say, um, key ideas in many of the classrooms around the world. And this is where UDL or Universal Design for Learning can actually step in and help educators to maybe structure the curriculum better or maybe to structure the assessments better, just so that uh, we make sure that we include all people. So this is one of the key focuses of the UDL platform or of the UDL, UDL framework. Uh, and I will call it UDL from now on rather than saying universal design for learning every single time because uh, that makes it a bit faster and easier. Now, the whole framework started um, being defined and uh, built uh, by David H. Rose um, and uh, at the Harvard Graduate School of Education and, uh, and, that, and by the Center of Applied Special Technology back in the 90s. So it's not something very new. Uh, but it's something that's very relevant and still very, very useful to keep uh, our eyes on. And I would say that uh, it's something that needs to be implemented by more schools all over the world. What, are, what is the foundation for UDL? It is based on scientific insights into how humans learn. And we'll try to go through some of these uh, ideas today. And it can also be used to guide the development of uh, learning environments and learning spaces. So as I said, it's looking at curriculum, but also at the activities and also at how technology can be used uh, for uh, supporting the learning process as well. It, it is designed to remove roadblocks 
Uh, and uh, one of the main focus is this one, removing roadblocks for all students and also maximizing learning, of course. This would be an outcome because if you remove roadblocks and you actually make sure that students can get all the information they need, make traces and so on and so forth, this will directly impact learning as well. And because of this, and because of the fact that you are removing roadblocks, you're basically making learning more accessible for everybody in the classroom. And of course, um, we all, it's also looking at how we actually present the information uh, and thinking about removing those roadblocks. One key idea is that you adapt the content and assessment and everything to the learner rather than doing it the other way around and asking the learner to adapt to the information, for example. So what are the, where is this coming from? Universal design for learning. Right, where is the name come from? Uh, well, universal basically refers to curriculum that can be used and understood by every student in the classroom. So just as well as uh, anything that's universal is easy to use by anybody everywhere. Also UDL was built with this idea in mind. Now, curriculum as it's defined in UDL, it doesn't refer just to the content, right? So I, I briefly mentioned this a bit earlier as well. There are four parts that are covered and all of them can be tweaked and changed and improved using the UDL principles and the framework. So the instructional goals is one of them. And this is where, um, especially if we have clear learning objectives and the goals are clear both for us as educators and for our students, it will be easier for them to also have more agency in many cases because they will know at least what choice to make and what the next steps will be. Then we can talk about the methods. What type of methods do we use in the whole teaching and learning process? That can also be sort of improved and built upon using the UTL framework. Then of course you have the materials. So here you'll see me today giving you some examples of how we can use actually uh, some of the videos that were created by the Oxford University Press and uh, shared with teachers. Uh, so we can also look at that from the perspective of, okay, we have the methods for teaching, what materials are we using and how can those materials support our students learning? And then of course, we are looking also at the assessment. So, it, the idea is to actually give more space and room for the assessment as well, and to also allow students to show mastery in different ways. So this would be the universal part from, uh, from UDL, right? The design part refers to design in general. So when we think about design, you can think about, uh, or universal design, to bring also the word universal in, in the discussion, we can see design all over around us. So think about day-to-day -day activities or objects or things that involve design. For example, automatic doors, right? So when you go to a shop or enter a building outside of the building, the fact that you have automatic doors and the structure and where they are placed and whatnot, that's an example of universal design. That will help everybody that goes inside or outside that building and it will have other impacts uh, on the whole building structure. Dictation tools, that's another example of design that actually makes things uh, universal and available for everybody, right? So this is where we start with the idea of universal design. Now, when we apply universal design, and this would apply to any domain, not only to learning, you're actually bringing in flexibility and you're trying to accommodate the needs of all kinds of users. So we are going also into the uh, area of disabled people, for example, uh, and uh, the main idea is to, to give or to go beyond access, right? So we don't just want to uh, give access to those people or that sub-segment of the population, but we would actually ideally want to, of course, go beyond that, support them, challenge them, create a space where, where they can thrive and, uh, and flourish, right? So 
another way of looking at this and another key part is this bit. So whenever we design um, something for uh, a sub-segment of the population, that means extra support. Like for example, you design something that helps people with disabilities. The core idea behind it is that in doing so, we help not only that sub-segment of the population, but it helps also many, many others around them. And that's why uh, we have this idea of universal design uh, actually uh, being universal and uh, helping everybody. So basically UDL brings the same approach to the classroom. So ideas that we were used in universal design are now brought into the classroom and we are just trying to apply similar principles to the curriculum and as I said earlier, learning objectives, methods, materials, uh, and assessments. So just to give some examples, because we are talking about universal design and how it's helpful for everybody, uh, we can think about some examples, right? So if you have a wheelchair ramp, for example, like we have in this image, yes, indeed, the wheelchair ramp is useful for um, people that are in a wheelchair. Uh, and, uh, but besides that, it also is bringing lots of benefits for other users and many other people. Think about strollers. You have a mother with a young baby uh, and, uh, uh, and a stroller that will be of great benefit for her as well. The same thing goes with bikes. So if you have uh, students joining the school and they're coming by bike, it will help them to have such an access ramp and so on and so forth. So this is just one example from designing uh, a physical space that, as I said, even though the whole, one of the main goals of the um, wheelchair ramp would be to support disabled uh, people, it will actually have beneficial impacts on the whole population. Another example of this, and now we are moving more into the online space and even uh, teaching and learning already, subtitles or closed captions. So closed captions can be of tremendous help for people who are deaf. Uh, and who cannot hear or who have trouble hearing, right? So that's something that is, I would say, mandatory if you plan to use videos in this kind of setup. But having subtitles or having closed captions can be of great benefit in many other situations and for many other uh, people, right? So you can think about people that want to learn a new language. The fact that they can watch a video with subtitles in their own language that can definitely help them learn the language. Or even if it's just closed captions, it will help them pick up the words while watching the video and listening uh, and reading the text in the same language. Then we can think about other scenarios. You have, let's say, a really loud and noisy space like an airport or a restaurant. And uh, that's where closed captions on a video can actually still help um, people around understand what's happening in the video. Or even if, let's say, uh, you're at a hospital where you might still want to have a video playing, but you might want to keep the noise level down, same idea. You could have the subtitles or closed captions help people in the room understand what's happening in the waiting room, for example. And there are lots of other scenarios where closed captions could actually come in really handy. Now, that's why I wanted to give two examples from two different scenarios. The, building aspect or the physical space aspect and also the um, more moving towards the online uh, area. So even for example, when we have even a webinar right now, right? If um, we would have the closed captions enabled uh, in certain situations that would help some of the attendees maybe to um, um, have the text also written on the screen rather than just hearing me talk about it. And there are, different tools and platforms that actually can do that. And we get to the third part of universal design for learning, which is the learning. So, uh, and also, by the way, I would encourage you if you have any questions, uh, we will have a Q&A session at the end. So uh, definitely think about anything you want to ask and we'll be more than happy to, to answer them um, after, after we finish with the intro. As I said, we are now getting to the learning part of the UDL or the Universal Design for Learning. 
And the whole framework is built around this idea that different parts of the brain play different roles. Now, we will not go into a whole neuroscientific uh, debate, lesson, introduction, and whatnot. There are lots of different studies out there looking at how different areas of the brain work and how they are interconnected. Um, but we will just use one model for, for this and we'll focus on different networks in the brain and what they are actually doing, right? So this is what UDL was actually based upon. So there are three different uh, or there are different networks uh, involved in the whole learning process. And these are the three networks that uh, were mentioned. The recognition networks, the strategic networks, and the affective networks. Now, usually when we receive information, and when I say information, I mean sensory information, right? Like reading, hearing, uh, seeing things, and so on and so forth. Usually that information is received in the back of the brain. Um, so that would include the occipital and temporal lobes. And this is what constitutes the recognition networks. Or in other words, it's the what. This is where we see, here, we see things, we hear things, we smell, we taste, and so on and so forth. But especially when it comes to learning, this is the what, this is the content we, we sort of need to assimilate. Now, once this information is processed in the recognition networks, the information is relayed for meaning in the center of the brain or in the affective networks. So this is where we can also associate this with the why of the learning, right? And then we get to the frontal lobe or uh, the, the frontal lobes. Uh, and this is where the information is uh, uh, triggering a response or an action. Uh, and this is the strategic network or the how. How do you learn? How do you process information? What do you do with it? And so on and so forth. Now, what I want to clarify is that by no means uh, does this imply that this is a linear process or that there's a linear progression. You go from uh, the recognition networks to the strategic ones, to the effective ones, or so on and so forth. But uh, this is just a model looking at three broad learning networks. Uh, and this is what can be useful when we design the whole learning experiences. So uh, once again, this is where we can match these networks to the different uh, parts of the, the whole learning process. Now, why is it good for us as educators to be aware of these networks? Well, variability can overwhelm teachers because you have so many students, so many backgrounds, so many uh, different approaches. And it's good to have a system that helps us organize these things and simplify our life, right? Even though there is so much variability, the learner variability is actually predictable and it can be organized across these three networks. And this is where uh, UDL steps in. And uh, it just reminds us of the fact that learners do not have an isolated learning style. So I want to emphasize this. I'm not talking about learning styles here or the old theory of learning styles. Um, it's uh, just focusing on the fact that different parts of the brain work together in a given context to help students give meaning and uh, um, work on the information. There isn't a single way that a brain will perceive or engage or execute a task. Uh, and that's why having some variability also in our approach to learning will make sure that we have more students on board and we cover the needs of a diverse classroom. So what are the three main principles for the UDL framework? So when we bring those three things together, the universal design and learning, um, there are three pillars and three principles of the UDL framework. The main idea is to provide students multiple means of engagement, multiple means of representation, and multiple means of action and expression. So let's dive deeper into each one of them and see how they work together and how they make sense, right? So the first one that I want to talk about is providing multiple means of engagement. And as you see, we are uh, talking about the why of learning. And I want to start with the why of learning because this is maybe crucial for many students, uh, understanding how 
or what motivates them and why they would be engaged in different activities. So there, there's a great difference between students in when it comes to the, uh, the way they are motivated or the way you can engage them in the whole learning process. And here we can think about lots of different factors that can influence this. So you can look at the cultural background uh, or even the physiology, neurology, the structure of the brain. Um, there, that will bring a lot of subjectivity also on the student side. You can also look at the uh, previous knowledge, what do they already know about a topic. So there are lots of different things that can actually influence this. So the key part, the key idea is this. There isn't one perfect way of engaging all students or an optimal way for all learners uh, in every single context. And that's why it's always good to provide multiple means of engagement. So I just want to share some ideas for, for this bit. So you could give, for example, students options to choose from, or you could design assignments that are relevant to your student context rather than having just a generic um, uh, assignment for, uh, for um, across the board. You could create opportunities for students to move around. Now we talk a bit about flexible spaces and the way the classroom is designed, or if you have online environments also moving from breakout rooms, for example. And there's also the option to add game elements. So there was a big movement with gamification a while ago. Uh, you could also add game elements to the whole learning process, trying to engage students. Now, when we move to the multiple means of representation, we talk about the what, uh, what's the content? How do we work with the content for the students, right? And this is where we can think about learners differing in ways they perceive information and they comprehend that information. And um, some students that, because we are talking about designing the universal design once again, if you have students that have sensory disabilities, for example, or learning disabilities, or on the other end, you might have language or cultural differences. So you might have learners that uh, don't speak a language very well, but they are immersed in that language environment. These are just some examples for which uh, uh, we show us that students might need different approaches for delivering the content. The same goes for um, all students. It actually helps if you have multiple representations or multiple ways of presenting the information. There isn't one that's optimal for all students, once again. So this is where we can look at different ways of mixing and matching. Remember that we are talking about having multiple means of representation. So that means it's good to have more added to the table. So from hands-on activities to videos, to audio recordings, to um, uh, um, different handouts and so on and so forth. And then uh, the third pillar of UDL or the, uh, the third principle of UDL would be providing multiple means of action and expression. So this is where we look at the how, how students learn and how we can actually encourage them to choose their own way, right? So here we can look at how students navigate through a learning environment and how do they express what they know. Uh, and of course, we need to be aware of the fact that students approach tasks differently. So you might have some students that um, express themselves better in writing or some that might express better in uh, uh, via a video, for example, or presenting. And this is where you also need to think about the fact that students need strategy to organize the information, to organize their presentations, and so on and so forth. And this is also where students can differ. And there are some ideas uh, for actually diversifying assessments. So of course we have the classical pen and paper tests and the online tests, but you can also throw in other options like oral reports, creating video clips, asking students to create the video clips or comic strips, having different group projects and using maybe something like um, rubrics for assessment and so on and so forth. So, these are the three main pillars. Now, this was a very, very quick intro into the UDL framework. Uh, the UDL framework has also the guidelines, which actually help you break down these three pillars into different layers and different levels. And it helps you go deeper into the whole idea of how could I do this with my students, right? The question, though, is how do we use all of these things with our students? Because it sounds like a lot if you want to implement everything. 
And this is where tools can help us a lot uh, speed this process up and actually help us uh, implement this type of guidelines and process, procedures and ideas. And of course, I wanted to give a case study uh, at Puzzle. That's uh, the tool I'm working with a lot. Uh, and uh, well, I know that quite a lot of teachers know about that puzzle. So basically what you can do is you take videos and you can embed your assessment question on top of the videos, and then you can track your student progress. It's such a simple change to the videos, but this allows us to uh, adapt it and use it for different activities with our students. So for example, we could create a choice board where students choose from different videos they want to watch. Uh, and this would be uh, providing multiple means of engagement for our students. Or for multiple means of representation, we could offer materials in different formats. Uh, so we, we could complement worksheets with audio, video, we could have guided practice for them, we could have a read aloud shared with them via Edpuzzle, for example. And then when it comes to action and expression, we can also think about student projects where even in Edpuzzle, you can allow students to start from a video they choose rather than us giving them a video. And soon enough, they will also be able to record their own videos. So this is where I just, just as a quick example, uh, I want to um, give this as an example for a choice board. So we do have already videos created by the Oxford University Press, uh, right? And I wanted to show you how easy it is to actually uh, try one of the videos from uh, um, the material that's already created by the Oxford University Press. This is shared in Edpuzzle already. And I can easily just um, uh, use this one, for example. I, I would create a copy, I would uh, assign it to my students, and then I could even use it as a choice board, right? So this is where I could just go to my slideshow, and I could insert the link to the activity and I would let my students choose from what they want to work on. So I could have, these are all four videos I have chosen from the, uh, from the uh, list of videos created by the Oxford University Press already in Edpuzzle. And then I could share this choice board with my students. And in one easy move, I already gave them choice. I already have more ways of presenting the information because we have the video and then we have the questions on top and we can start building on this bit. So of course I could talk about, uh, I could talk about Edpuzzle and the way to use videos and about UDL for a whole day, but I am aware of the thing. So um, I also um, want to have a quick, short Q and A session. So I would be happy to hear if there are any questions from, uh, from the audience. Uh, so um, we can definitely, uh, we can definitely answer them. Did we receive any questions so far? Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Bogdan, for the shedding light on the topic of uh, UDL. And uh, we are now into our Q&A session. But uh, since time is upon us, we may have a chance to get one question from the floor. So let us check and see if there will be any questions from our audience. Just a moment. Anybody, uh, let's say somebody has some questions after the session and you're not, uh, you, you do not have the chance to ask them. If you want more resources, please be getting touch. With, you know, since we have a diverse audience, we have people from our, everywhere in the countries, state and regions or cities. And uh, in the process of maybe uh, implementation or localization, how do we, uh, what should we pay attention to? I think this is what some of our audience uh, may want to know about. Uh, well, it's, all, it's always, always, always a good idea to look at your context. Always start with the context um, and look at what's happening in your classroom or in your immediate uh, so when we talk about the design process, there are different uh, frameworks for the design and basically what you do in the design process is you break down a big project into manageable chunks. And that's the whole idea with UDL as well. If you look at everything and you want to provide everything at once, it can be very overwhelming. So take it step by step. And that's why the whole process of having the guidelines 
time span that needs to be out because it's breaking down the process into different steps that need different manageable chunks. Now, there are different design stages or sorry, design models if you want to talk about design in general. Uh, but in the design thinking process, that's one of them. For example, you start to empathize. And that's, that's why I'm saying this is where you need to look at the context, you need to understand the students, their needs, what's happening in their world. And then you go to the next steps and uh, you decide what to do next, what, what, uh, what you need to fix, what are the roadblocks, and you work on that. Uh, so I would say that this is where you can start to just understand the context and setting up the stage. And that makes sense. And thank you for the useful advice. And I think time now is uh, uh, upon us. And uh, I do like to conclude the session here. Thank you very much, Bogdan, again, for joining us from Prague. And thank you for all the audience from around the world for listening to this webinar. Uh, please remember, our audience, please remember to download your e-certificate from our website. And we'll be sending you also a post-webinar survey. We'd love to have your feedback for us and your comments as well. And lastly, uh, we do have other webinars uh, for the rest of the day and in the afternoon. So it'll be exciting to have you. We look forward to seeing you there. So thank you and goodbye to all. Thank you again. Yeah.